Hey y'all and welcome back to another episode of Becoming No One. I'm your host Big Taj and today we're going to continue to talk about stanza three. So just a quick recap on stanza three. It is the reawakening stage of the manifested universe to life. So it's when the monad emerges from their state of oneness with the source. And this is also where the divine spark happens. So last week we covered the first six parts and today we'll discuss the last six parts. So let's jump right in into part seven. Part seven says, behold, O Lana the radiant child of the two the unparalleled refugent glory bright space son of the dark space who emerges from the depths of the great dark water it is aiou the younger the whom thou knowest now as Quan Shayin, he shines forth as the sun. He is the blazing divine dragon of wisdom. The Eka is Shator four, and the Shator takes to itself three, and the union produces a Sapta seven, and whom are the seven which become the Tridasa, the trice ten, the host of the multitude. Behold he lifting the veil and unfurling it from east to west. He shuts out the above and leaves the below to see to be seen as the great illusion. He marks the places for the shining ones, stars, and turns the upper space into the shoreless sea of fire and the one manifested element into the great water. So the secret doctrine actually describes this as the bright space son of the dark space corresponding to the ray dropped at the first thrill of the new dawn into the cosmic great depths from which it reemerges, differentiated as aeiou the younger or what they call the new life to become to the end of the life cycle the germ of all things he is the incorporeal man who contains in himself the divine idea the generator of light and life to use an expression of Philo Judeus, he is called the blazing dragon of wisdom because firstly, he is that which the Greek philosopher called the logos, the verbium of the thought divine. And secondly, because in esoteric philosophy, this first manifestation being the synthesis or the aggregate of universal wisdom, A-E-I-O-U, the son of the sun, contains in himself the seven creative hosts, the Sephiroth, and is this the essence of manifested wisdom? He who bathes into the light of Aiyu will never be deceived by the veil of illusion. It goes on to say that Quan Sha Yin is identical with and equivalent to the Sanskrit Avalokiteshara, and as such, he is an androgynous deity like the Tetragrammaton and all the logis of antiquity. It is only by some sects in China that he is anthropomorphized and represented with female attributes. When under his female aspect, he becomes Quan Yin, the goddess of mercy called the divine voice. The latter is a patron deity of Tibet and of the island of Puto in China, where both deities have a number of monasteries. All right, so let's take a second to break this down. Now, Lanu is a synonym for disciple, so it's supposed to represent a student of a spiritual master or guru. So Lanus have decided to follow this path of enlightenment. So this is actually speaking about us deciding to embark on this journey of self-discovery by coming to this plane of illusions where we get to make an authentic choice with pain and suffering being our catalyst. So the choice, again, is service to self or service to others. Doesn't matter which path you choose. During this process, you will have to learn and grow along the way using your free will. So the part that says son of the dark space who emerges from the dark waters is talking about the ray of light or masculine principle hitting the deep waters of the feminine principle to create new life, which is made up of different aspects, but still as one, which we call the AEIOU. And the AIOU is also used to talk about different logi stages during this manifestation process. So when it says the younger bright space, they're talking about the result of the ray that comes from the first logos and impregnates the germ or seed of new life, which comes from absolute light or what we call darkness because of the illusion. OK, so this is still in the unmanifested stage because the chaos has not yet sprung into action yet to start the creation process. But the divine thought has just been projected here. So this is the first logos emerging. Now, when the Bible says, let there be light, it's talking about this ray of light or matter masculine principle emerging from darkness and become and being directed towards the feminine principle to start this creation process. 
when it comes to them saying the incorporeal man is referring to the manifestation, not having a material or physical form yet, but containing this divine idea. Now, remember, everything starts in the spiritual realm first. So that is what we're talking about here. So this is before the physical manifestation of creation or the generator of light and light. First, he is the word of thought divine. Then he is absolute or universal wisdom composed of the different aspects. Now, the AEILU contains the seven creative hosts, which to me refers to the FOHOT, which is the electrifying principle, which causes the differentiation of the seven planes of consciousness. So the seven creative hosts, the different densities of consciousness that you will have to evolve through in the manifested universe, which is the essence of manifested wisdom. Now, when you gain more knowledge in the plane of illusions, you start to unlock new levels of consciousness and ascend through these different levels or hosts of wisdom. So he who bathes in the light will never be deceived by Maya or illusion. To me, this means that any being that seeks divine wisdom or knowledge will never be deceived by these illusions of this plane because knowledge is the illuminator of lies into truth. It is the key to enlightenment. So enlightenment is exactly what it sounds like to add light or to illuminate. It's the process of educating yourself to gain understanding and to spread knowledge. Now, the part that talks about Quan Shi Yin and Quan Yin represent the two aspects, male and female, nature and man, spirit and matter, okay, of divine wisdom and intelligence. So the Quan Shen Yin is the logos at the highest principle in the manifested cosmos, the first manifested creative power, the divine voice. To me, this is thoughts, okay? being transferred into words while the Quan Yin is the spiritual soul. To me, this means emotions, the mental and spiritual components of us, which manifest before the physical, but I could be wrong again, use your own discernment. Now, part B says the dragon of wisdom is the one, the echo, which is in Sanskrit or Saka. It is curious that Jehovah's name in Hebrew should also be the one Akkad. His name is Akkad said the rabbins, the Theologists ought to decide which of the two is derived from the other linguistically and symbolically, surely not the Sanskrit. Now, the one and the dragon are expressions used by the ancients in connection with their respective logi. Jehovah, esoterically as Elohim, is also the serpent or dragon that tempted Eve. And the dragon is an old glyph from astral light primordial principle, which is the wisdom of chaos. So archaic philosophy recognizing neither good nor evil as the fundamental or independent power but starting from the absolute awe which is universal perfection eternally traced back through the course of natural evolution to pure light condensing gradually into form hence becoming matter or evil it was left with the early and ignorant christian fathers to degrade the philosophical and highly scientific idea of this emblem of the dragon into the absurd superstition called the devil now they took it from the later Zoroastrians who saw devils or the evil in the Hindu devas and the word evil thus became by double transmutation D apostrophe evil in every tongue. So the Diablos, the Diablo, the Diavolos and the true film. But the pagans have always shown a philosophical discrimination in their symbols. The primitive symbol of the serpent symbolizes divine wisdom and perfection and had always stood for psychical regeneration and immortality hence Hermes calling the serpent the most spiritual being now Moses who was initiated in the wisdom of Hermes following suit in Genesis and the Gnostics serpent with the seven vowels over its head being the emblem of the seven hierarchies of the septenary and planetary creators hence also the Hindu serpent Sesha and Ananta the infinite a name of Vishnu whose first Vahan or vehicle on the primordial waters is this serpent Yet they are all made a difference between the good and the bad serpent, the astral light of the Kabbalists between the former, the embodiment of divine wisdom in the region of the spiritual and the latter evil on the plane of matter. Now, Jesus accepted the serpent as the synonym or wisdom, and this formed part of his teachings. Be ye wise as serpents, he says. In the beginning, before mother became father mother, the fiery dragon moved in the infinitude alone, which is in the book of Sarah Perenji. Now, the Aterayer Brahmana calls the earth Sarah Perenji. This stands for the serpent queen and the mother of all that moves. Now, before our globe became egg shaped in the universe, also a long trail of cosmic dust or fire mist moved in, writhed like a serpent in space. 
The spirit of God moving on chaos was symbolized by every nation in the shape of a fiery serpent breathing fire and light upon the primordial waters until it had incubated cosmic matter and made it assume the annular shape of the serpent and its tail and its mouth, which symbolizes not only eternity and infinitude, but also the globular shape of all the bodies formed within the universe from the fiery mist. Now the universe as well as earth and man cast off periodically serpent-like their old skins to assume new ones after a time of rest. The serpent is surely a not less graceful or a more unpoetical image than the caterpillar or chrysalis from which springs the butterfly, the Greek emblem of psyche, the human soul. Now the dragon was also the symbol of the logos with the Egyptians as with the Gnostics in the book of Hermes, Pymander, the oldest and the most spiritual logo of the Western continent appeared to Hermes in the shape of a fiery dragon of light, fire, and flamed. The Pymander, the thought divine personified, says, The light is me, and I am the noose, the mind, or manu. I am thy God, and I am far older than the human principle which escapes from the shadow, which is darkness or concealed deity. I am the germ of thought, the replacent word, the son of God, all that thus sees and hear in the is the verbium of the master it is the thought which is mahat which is god the father now this part is actually really deep part b is letting us know where we get the symbology of the serpent or dragon and how it has been misconstrued by finite minds that did not understand the adept teachings of esotericism so they use their own level of consciousness still influenced by maya or illusion to translate and interpret it which led to this creation of the concept of the devil okay now the devil is the misinterpretation of evil which just means matter okay it's the physical part of us so the serpent is symbolic of the cycle of wisdom which is why they refer to kundalini energy as the serpent because it travels up the spine which is where your energy portals are or your chakras which directly correspond with the seven densities of consciousness okay so as you learn you grow you evolve the serpent or wisdom travels up the spine through the higher levels of consciousness via these energy portals in our body activating them until you reach a high enough consciousness to see through illusions, okay? Which is equivalent to opening up your third eye or being able to gain access to your psychic senses, which can see through this veil of illusion, all right? Now, there is no such thing as sin. To me, Eve being tempted by the serpent is indicative of our feminine aspect or our soul deciding to embark on this evolutionary journey of enlightenment or divine wisdom. The story goes that she was in the garden and was convinced by the evil serpent to take the fruit from the tree of life, which no longer protected her from the world of sin. Now, when our soul decides to experience divine wisdom, it requires us to fall in consciousness into the realm of illusions where you will have to make mistakes and you'll have to learn and grow from those mistakes that you make so that you can make the choice between the two paths and evolve your consciousness from the lowest level back towards absolute per perfection. Okay. So it's an allegory and this is not exclusive to man. This represents the evolutionary process of all manifested being. Okay. So we are infinite beings having a finite experience. The infinite part of our being can see through illusions while the finite version cannot because it has only has access to the physical senses, not the spirit ones like the infinite portion so evil is just another word for matter or the vehicle used to navigate the plane of illusions but it was demonized by those who did not understand so the serpent is everything that moves and we have learned that motion is in everything in this lower plane like the material plane earth is called the mother of serpents because she is the host of everything that moves aka matter in the material plane so the part where it says the spirit of god moving on chaos is referring to our spirit or mind using our chaos or emotions to understand the knowledge we are receiving so that we can continue to evolve learn grow through the seven densities of consciousness now as we grow and learn we become new versions of ourselves, shedding our skin like a snake or a serpent Again, once you know better, you have to do better. So when you get new knowledge, you you have to apply it using how you feel and um, figure out what steps you need to take next. OK, so you release this old version of you as you learn and become more evolved, more enlightened, 
version of yourself, which is represented by the skin shedding process of a snake. Now, I hope this connects it all for you. OK, women are not evil. Women are not the cause of sin. Eve was supposed to be representative of our feminine principle. OK, our soul embarking on this journey of enlightenment, which causes us to fall into the lap of Maya or this place of illusions where we have to work our way back up to absolute perfection through gaining wisdom and knowledge, okay? Through learning, through growing, through evolving. And let me make a really quick correction. The spirit of God moving across the waters of chaos is supposed to represent this divine thought being sent out in this first logos, okay? So it's the unmanifested logos being sent out. So next, the secret doctrine says the celestial ocean, the ether, is the breath of the father, the life giving principle, the mother, the Holy Spirit, for these are not separate and their union is life. OK, this is just telling us that both aspects are needed to create life, masculine or your mind, knowledge or heat and feminine, your soul, your emotions or water. OK, now it says here we find the unmistakable echo of the archaic secret doctrine as now expounded. Only the latter does not place at the head in evolution of life the father, who comes third and is the son of the mother, but the eternal and ceaseless breath of the all. The Mahat, which is understanding universal mind or thought, before it is manifested itself as Brahma or Siva, appears as Vishnu, says Sankha Sara. Hence, Mahat has several aspects, just as the Logos has. Mahat is called the Lord in the primary creation and is, in this sense, universal cognition or thought divine. But that Mahat, which was first produced, is afterwards called egoism when it is born as I. That is said to be the second creation and the translator, an able and learned Brahmin, not a European Orientalist, explained in a footnote when the Mahat develops into the feeling of self-consciousness, I then is assumed the name of egoism, which translates into our esoteric phraseology, means when Mahat is transformed into the human manas or even that of the finite gods and becomes um shit. Why it is called the Mahat of the second creation or the ninth, that of the Kumara in Vishnu Purana will be explained in book two. So the sea of fire is then the super astra, which is the numinal light, the first radiation from the root, the Molokha Priti, the undifferentiated cosmic substance, which becomes the astral matter. It is also called the fiery serpent as described above. If the student bears in mind that there is but one universal element, which is infinite, unborn and undying, and that all the rest, as in the world of phenomenon, are but so many variation, various differentiated aspects and transformations, correlations they are now called of that one, from cosmical down to microcosmical effects, from superhuman down to human and subhuman beings, the totality in short or of objective existence, then the first and chief difficulty will disappear in occultist cosmology may be mastered. All the Kabbalist and occultists, Eastern and Western, recognize a the identity of the father mother with primordial atheism in Orakasa, which is astral light, and B, its homogeny before the evolution of the sun. Cosmically, Fohat, for it is cosmic electricity. Fohat hardens and scatters the seven brothers, which means that the primordial electric entity for the Eastern occult insists that electricity is an entity, electrifies into life and separates primordial stuff or pre-genetic matter into atoms themselves the source of life and all consciousness their existence and universal agent unique to all forms and of life that is called odd ob and or active and passive positive and negative like night and day it is the first light in creation the first light of the primordial elohim the atom male and female scientifically electricity and life okay so before we dive into the second section of part b we have to understand that we can be multiple things at once because we have multiple parts. That goes the same for Mahat and Fohat and Logos. They all have several meanings because they can also be multiple things depending on what part of us they're talking about or what stage of manifestation we are referring to. Okay, so this section is telling us that we have to understand that everything that we experience in our reality is a variation of the same thing. And when we are able to fully understand what that means, then we will be able to master the universe okay so good and evil both come from the all they are the same thing being experienced at differing 
degrees, okay? So neither is wrong, but both are necessary. The Mahat is understanding universal mind thought. In the stages of creation is called the Lord or thought divine. This is on the cosmic level. But once divine thought reaches man and self-consciousness is involved, it is transformed into egoism, okay? So self-consciousness is the I, which is what we talked about earlier in the stanzas. The astral light on the cosmic level is the first radiation from the root or the Molokha Priti, this undifferentiated cosmic substance, but when it reaches earth, it is astral matter, okay? So it goes from being the sea of fire to the fiery serpent. Now, cultists acknowledge the father mother as primordial aether or akasa, which is the astral light or the universal space, which radiates the first light or ray, which is basically expressed thought, okay? And it's oneness before the sun universe differentiated matter separates as fohat, the cosmic electricity. So they consider electricity to be an entity that electrifies life and separates primordial matter into atoms, which again are the source of all consciousness in life. Electricity is the male principle and life is the female principle and they make up everything. That includes what we consider to be positive and negative, day and night, active and passive. They are all the same thing being experienced at different variables. So this is just letting us know that the principle of gender, meaning that everything that is manifested has both feminine and male aspects is also the reason for the principle of polarity, which means that we are experiencing this same thing at different poles. And although they may seem different, they are of the same thing. Now, part C says the ancients represented it by a serpent for Fohat hisses as he glides hither and thither. The Kabbalah figures it with the Hebrew letter Teth, which symbol is the serpent, which played such a prominent part in the mysteries. Its universal value is nine, for it is the ninth letter of the alphabet and the ninth door of the 50 portals or gateways that lead to the concealed mysteries of being. It is the magical agent par excellence and designated in hermetic philosophy life infused into primordial matter. The essence that composes all things and the spirit that determines their form. But there are two secret hermetical operations, one spiritual and the other material correlative and forever united. Thou shalt separate the earth from the fire, the subtile from the solid, that which ascends from earth to heaven and descends again from heaven to earth. It, the subtile light, is the strong force of every force, for it conquers every subtile thing and penetrates into every solid. Thus was the world formed, which is what Hermes said. It was not Zeno alone, the founder of the Stoics, who taught that the universe evolves when its primary substance is transformed from the state of fire into that of air, then into water. Heraclitus of Ephesus maintained that the one principle that underlies all phenomenon in nature is fire. The intelligence that moves the universe is fire and fire is intelligence. And while Anximenes said that the same the same of air in Thales of Miletus, which was 600 year BC of water, the esoteric doctrine reconciles all those philosophers by showing that though each was right, the system of none was complete. Now, this part just talks about how ancient civilizations have symbolically represented life infused into primordial matter and that numerically it's represented by the number nine, which again, we all know nine has been demonized, but we're not going to go there today. Now, the number nine is meant to represent the essence that is composed of all things and the spirit that determines the form in conjunction. Okay, so spirit matter, anything manifested in united has two hermetic operations, one being spiritual and the other being physical or material. And these are to remain separate. Again, this is telling us that our mind, spirit, consciousness, or male principle is separate altogether from our body vehicle or physical component, but connected and made whole through this electrifying principle or soul through water or aether, okay, through nature. So the principle that underlies all phenomenon in nature is not just one element, even though throughout the years, different philosophers have said different things they were all right but just had a half truth it is fire water and air that creates everything the universe evolves when it when its primary substance is transformed from the state of fire into air and then into water it is a combination of all three that underlines everything 
Now let's move on to section eight. It says, where was the germ and where was now darkness? Where is the spirit of the flame that burns in thy lap, O Lanu? The germ is that and that is light, the white brilliant sun of the dark hidden father. Now part A says the answer to the first question suggested by the second, which is the reply of the teacher to the pupil, contains in a single phrase one of the most essential truths of occult philosophy. It indicates the existence of things imperceptible to our physical senses, which are of far greater importance, more real and more permanent than those that appeal to these senses themselves. Before the Lanu can hope to understand the transcendentally metaphysical problem contained in the first question, he must be able to answer the second, while the very answer he gives to the second will furnish him with the clue to the correct reply to the first. Okay, so in the Sanskrit commentary on this stanza, the terms used for concealed and unrevealed principle are many. In the earliest MSS of Indian literature, this unrevealed abstract deity has no name. It is called that, tad in Sanskrit. It means all that is, was, and will be, or that can be received by the human mind. Among such appellations, given, of course, only in esoteric philosophy, as the unfathomable darkness and the whirlwind, it is also called the it of the Kalahamsa, or the Kalahamsa, and even the Kali Hamza, which is black swan. Here, the M and the N are convertible, and both sound like the nasal French on and om, or again, N and M. As in the Hebrew Bible, many of the mysterious sacred names in Sanskrit convey to the profane ear no more than some ordinary and often vulgar word because it's concealed anagrammatically or otherwise. The word of Hamza, or esoterically Hamza, is just a case. Hamza is equal to Hamza, three word meaning. I am he in English. While divided in still another way, it will read Soham, which is he is I. Soham being equal to Sa, he, and Aham, I, or I am he. In this alien contained the universe mystery, the doctrine of the identity of man's essence with God essence for him who understands the language of wisdom. Hence the glyph of and the allegory about Kalaham Hansa or Hamza and the name given to Brahma, which is the neuter, which is the body, the vehicle later on to the male Brahma and the Hansa Vahana. He who uses the Hansa as his vehicle. The same word may be read Kalam Sa and or which means I am I in the eternity of time answering the biblical or rather Zoroastrian I am that I am the same doctrine is found in the Kabbalah as witness the following extracts from an unpublished MS by Mr. S. Lindell McGregor Mathers the learned Kabbalist the three pronouns Hoa Ata Ani he thou I are used to symbolize the idea of the macro prosopis and the micro prosopis in the hebrew kabbalah hoa he is applied to the hidden and concealed macro prosopis atom thou to the micro prosopis and ani i to the latter when is represented as speaking it is to be noted that each of these names consist of the three letters of which the letter alf a forms the conclusion of the first word how in the commencement of ata and ani as if there were the connecting link between them. But Alf is the symbol of the unity and consequently of the unvarying idea of the divine operating through all these. But behind the Alf in the name Hoa in the letter H and O, the symbol of the number six and five, the male and female, the hexam and the pentagram, and the number of these three words, Hoa, Ata, Ani, are 12, 406, and 61, which resume in the key numbers 3, 10, and 7 by Kabbalah of the nine chambers, which is a form of the exegetical rule of Tamara. Okay, so to explain, these two first questions, where was the germ and where was the now darkness, are pointing out that the true reality is more real than the reality that we are experiencing with our physical senses. And the true reality is more real than that what we can sense in this physical incarnation, okay? So the germ is the eternal and undifferentiated atoms of the future matter. It is a figurative expression to indicate the unmanifested nature of matter it is infinite and boundless it is the noumenon or the cause of physical manifestation and the darkness is the absolute true reality it is where we will all return once we ascend through these seven densities of universal consciousness when we say that we will return to the all it is the state of non-being where there is no manifested light or vibration 
which again happens before the manifest the universe is created. Darkness happens for the seven eternities and then the creation process starts. So in order to answer these first two questions, you have to understand their connection. By answering the second first, you will be able to answer the first correctly. You have to first acknowledge that before we are physically manifested, we are spiritually manifested. And the unfathomable darkness is called the Kalahamsa, which is a Sanskrit word and a sacred name. The way you pronounce it matters because words create. So Hamza has many variations in pronunciation, which changes its meaning. Hamza can be broken into three words, meaning in English, which is I am he, but it can also be divided into Soham, which is he is I. The word is indicative of the identity of our essence and its connection to God's essence. So this is the language of wisdom. Kalahamza can also be read as Kalamza, which means I am I, which is where we get the biblical I am that I am from. So this can be found in the Kabbalah when they talk about the three pronouns, Hoa, which is he, which refers to the macrocosm, Atta, which is thou in the microcosm, and Ani, I, which represents the he or the mic macrocosm when it is speaking. So the rules of Tamora that they were speaking about are the ancient practice used by Kabbalists to organize and rearrange sentences and words in the Bible. So it was used to translate words that did not have a direct meaning into words we can understand. So now just by understanding this is a red flag because or a red flag should be going off because if words are sacred and hold power, then the original translation and pronunciation is important. So the secret doctrine goes on to say it is useless to attempt to explain the mystery in full. Materialists and the men of modern science will never understand it since in order to obtain clear perception of it, one has to first of all admit the postulate of a universally diffused omnipresent eternal deity in nature. Secondly, to have fathomed the mystery of electricity in its true essence. And thirdly, to credit man with being the separately symbol, the terrestrial plane of the one great unit, the Logos, which is itself the seven vowed sign, the breath crystallized into the word. He who believes in all this has also to believe in the multiple combinations of the seven planets of occultism and of the Kabbalah with the 12 zodiacal signs to attribute as we do to each planet and to each constellation an influence which in the words of Eli Starr, a French occultist, is proper to it, beneficent or maleficent, and this after the planetary spirit which rules it, who in his turn is capable of influencing men and things which are found in harmony with him and with which he has an affinity. For these reasons, and since few believe in the foregoing, all that can now be given is that in both cases, the symbol of Hansa, whether I, he, goose, or swan, is an important symbol representing, for instance, divine wisdom. Wisdom is darkness beyond the reach of man. For all exoteric purposes, Hansa, as every Hindu knows, is a fabulous bird, which when given milk mixed with water for its food in the allegory separates the two drinking the milk and leaving the water thus showing inherent wisdom milk standing symbolically for spirit and water for matter that this allegory is very ancient and dates from very early archaic period it shows by the mention of a certain caste named hama or hanza which was the one caste par excellence when far back in the midst of a forgotten past there was along the hindus only one veda one deity one caste there is also a range in the himalayans described in the old book as being situated north of mount maru called hamza and connected with episodes pertaining to the history of religious mysteries and initiations as to the name of kalahanza being the supposed vehicle of brahma parajapati in the exoteric texts and translations of the Orientalists, it is quite a mistake. Brahma, the neuter, is called by the Kalahansa, and Brahma, the male, Hansa Vahana, because forsooth his vehicle or Vahan is a swan or goose, which is from the Hindu dictionary. This is purely exoteric gloss. Esoterically and logically, if Brahma, the infinite, is that is all that is described by the Orientalists, namely agreeably with the Vedic text, an abstract deity in no way characterized by the description of any human attributes, and is still maintained that he or it is called Kalahansa, then how can it ever become the Vahan of Brahma? 
the manifested finite God. It is quite the reverse. The swan or goose Hansa is the symbol of that male or temporary deity as he, the emanation of the primordial ray, is made to serve as a vaha or vehicle for that divine ray, which otherwise could not manifest itself in the universe being antiphrasically itself an emanation of darkness. For our human intellect at any rate, it is Brahma. Then who is Kalahansa in the ray, the Hansa Vahana? So this part is just trying to get us to understand that there are three things that we have to acknowledge in order for us to understand creation. One, there is a universally omnipresent eternal deity in nature. Two, we have to understand the true essence of electricity. And three, we are the breath that was manifested by word. Word is the physical manifestation of thought. So us living in this material plane is a result of the thought divine being manifested into word, which crystallized us as manifested matter. We are the logos, which is the seven vowel sign, A-E-I-O-U. If you believe the three above, you also have to believe the multiple variations of the seven planetary bodies and the 12 zodiac signs that come from them because they have planetary spirits that affect and influence us. And finally, we have to understand that Hamza, I, he, or whatever you want to call it, the swan, the goose, is a symbol for divine wisdom, specifically wisdom in darkness that is beyond the reach of men. The Hindus use Hamza in an allegory about a bird who, with when given milk mixed with water, it is able to separate the two, drinking the milk and leaving the water, which is a symbol for inherent wisdom. The milk represents spirit and the water represents matter. The last of part eight says, as to the strange symbol chosen, it is equally suggestive. The true mystic significance being the idea of universal matrix figured by the primordial waters of the deep or the opening for the reception and subsequently for the issue of that on ray, the logos, which contains in itself the other seven procreative rays of power, the logoi or the builders, hence the choice by the Rosicrix of the aquatic fowl. When swan or pelican with seven young ones for a symbol modified and adapted to the religion of every country. In Sof is called the fiery soul of the pelican in the book of numbers appearing with every man of Antara as Narion or Swayambuhava, the self-existing, and penetrating into the mundane egg, it emerges from it at the end of the divine incubation as Brahma or Parajapati, a progenitor of the future universe into which he expands. He is Purusha, which is spirit, but he is also Parakriti, which is matter. Therefore, it is only after separating himself into two halves, Brahma Vak, the female, and Brahma Viraj, the male, that the Parajapati becomes the male Brahma. This is basically saying that the one ray or the Logi contains in itself the seven rays of power or the builders that create the universe. This is just saying that once the ray of light impregnates the waters of chaos, it becomes both spirit and matter separating itself into two halves. Part nine says light is cold flame and the flame is fire and the fire produces heat which yields water and the water of life in the great mother chaos. Part A says it must be remembered that the words light, fire and flame used in the stanzas have been adopted by translators thereof from the vocabulary of old fire philosophers in order to render better the meaning of the archaic terms and symbols employed in the original. Otherwise, they would have remained entirely un unintelligible to the European reader, but to a student of the occult, the term used will be sufficiently clear. This is just basically saying and letting us know that our understanding of light, fire, and flame are different than those of occultists. So the definitions have been translated from fire philosophers so that we can fully understand from our level of consciousness. And the fire philosophers are supposed to be the experts, okay? So all these light, fire, hot, cold, heat, water, and the waters of life are all on our plane, the progeny, or as a modern physicist would say, the correlations of electricity, mighty word, and a still mightier symbol, sacred generators of the no less sacred progeny, of fire, the creator, the preserver, and the destroyer, of light, the essence of our divine ancestors, of flame, the soul of things, and electricity, the one life at the upper rung of being, and astral fluid, the anthenor of the alchemist at its lowest, good and evil, God and devil. 
So light, flame, hot, cold, water, and the waters of life are all byproducts or correlate to electricity. Fire is the creator, the preserver, and the destroyer. Light is the essence of our divine ancestors. The flame is the soul of things. Electricity is the one life at the rung of being. Astral fluid is the anthener of the alchemist at the lowest. Now, why is light called in this stanza cold flame? Because in order of cosmic evolution taught by occultists, the energy that actuates matter after its first formulation into atom is generated on our plane by cosmic heat. And because cosmos in the sense of dissociated matter was not before that period, the first primordial matter, eternal and coval with space, which has neither a beginning nor an end, is neither hot nor cold, but it is of its own special nature, says the commentary. Heat and cold are relevant qualities and pertain to the realm of the manifested world, which all proceeds from the manifested hyle, which is its absolutely latent aspect, is referred to as the cold virgin, and when awakened to life as the mother. The ancient Western cosmogic myth state that at first there were but cold mists which were the father and the prolific slime the mother eyeless or hyal from which crept forth the mundane snake matter isis primordial matter then before it emerges from the plane of the never manifesting and awaking to the thrill of action under the impulse of fohat is but a cool radiance colorless formless tasteless and devoid of every quality and aspect even such are her firstborn the four sons who are one and become seven the entities by whose qualifications and names the ancient eastern occultists called the four of the seven primal centers of forces or atoms that develop later into the great cosmic elements now divided into 70 of so sub elements known to science the four primal natures of the first dihon kohans are the so-called for want of a better term acoustic ethereal watery and fiery answering in the terminology of practical occultism to scientific definition of gases which convey a clear idea to both occultists and laymen must be defined as parahydronic paraoxygenic oxyhydronic and ozic and perhaps nitro ozic the latter forces of gases in occultism super sensual yet atomic substances being the most effective and active when energizing on the plane of more grossly differentiated matter these are both electropositive and electronegative so this is telling us that the cold flame is used because the manifested mother or earth was referred to as the cold virgin based off this myth that at first, there was only cold mist, which is the father, and the prolific slime, which is the mother, which produced primordial matter. Then once Fohat, or the electrifying principle, strikes, it is, it is devoid of qualities. Then four, the masculine principle, becomes seven when it is joined with three, the feminine principle, and becomes the great cosmic element. A cosmic, which is the divine thought or air, ethereal, which is earth, watery, which is water, and fiery, which is fire, all manifested matter is composed of the four elements, which are really seven. Now, part 10 says, Father, Mother, spin a web whose upper end is fastened to spirit, Purusha, and the light of the one darkness, and the lower one to matter, Prakriti. It's the spirit's shadowy end. And this web is the universe spun out of the two substances made in one, which is the Swabhavata. Part A says, in the Manduka, up Upanishad is written as a spider throws out and retracts its web as herbs spring up in the ground. So is the universe derived from the undecaying one Brahma as the germ of unknown darkness is the material from which all evolves and develops as the web from the spider as foam from the water. This is only graphic and true if Brahma the creator is as the term derived from the root Bri to increase and expand. Brahma expands and becomes the universe woven out of his own substance. The same idea has been beautifully expressed by Goeth, who says, Thus at the roaring loom of time I ply and weave the God, the garment thou heest him by. This section is just using spiders as an allegory because spiders basically create this substance from themselves and throw it out through contracting and retracting. It creates this web and so does the universe. So it is made of itself and it expands and retracts itself to create. In the case, the web is the universe. 
which is the substance that is thrown out and eventually it will retract back into itself once it ha has went through the evolutionary process. That is the same with man too. Anything that is manifested and goes through this evolutionary process, okay? So whatever is manifested or produced from all or God energy will expand and retract like a spider throwing out its web. Part 11 says it, the web expands when the breath of fire, the father is upon it. It contracts when the breath of the mother, the root of matter touches it. Then the sons, the elements with their respective powers or intelligence dissociate and scatter to return into their mother's bosom at the end of the great day and re become one with her. When it, the web is coiling, it becomes radiant and its son expands and contracts through their heart own selves and hearts they embrace infinitude okay so the secret doctrine said the expanding of the universe under the breath of fire is very suggestive in the light of the fire mist period of which modern science speaks so much and knows in reality so little great heat breaks up the compound elements and resolves the heavenly bodies into their primeval one element explains the commentary once disintegrated into its prima constituents by getting within the attraction and reach of a focus or center of heat which is energy of which many are carried about to and from in space a body whether alive or dead will be vaporized and held in the bosom of the mother and to fohot gathering a few of the clusters of cosmic matter which is the nebulae we talked about will by giving it an impulse set in motion anew develop the required heat and then leave it to follow its own new path of growth so this is basically just saying that the great breath or the divine ray of heat being sent out causes the differentiating of the female from the male principle but also causes the creation of the manifested version which will contain all the elemental components so the products of the male and female principles combining whether it is the universe man or some other creation that is what they mean by a body whether alive or dead the vehicle is created then the full heart gathers the cosmic material it needs from these clusters of cosmic matter created in the rest period of the universe this is that milky substance or nebula that contains the seeds of future universes or worlds the full heart will electrify these clusters or cosmic matter which sets into motion the creation process which it has no control over because all manifested material follows its own growth pattern based on what it must achieve in this evolutionary process okay so the expanding and contracting of the web the world stuff or atoms expressed here the pulsatory movement for it is the regular contraction and expansion of the infinite and shoreless ocean of that which we call the noumenon of matter emanated by swab havat which causes the universal vibration of atoms but it is also suggestive of something else it shows that the ancients were acquainted with that which is now the puzzle of many scientists, especially astronomers. The cause of the first initiation of matter or the world stuff, the paradox of the heat produced by the refrigerated contraction and other such cosmic riddles. For it points unmistakably to the knowledge by the ancients of such phenomenon. There is heat eternal and external in every atom, says the manuscript commentaries, to which the writer has had access. The breath of the father or spirit and the breath or heat of mother matter and they give explanation which shows that the modern theories of the extinction of the solar fires by loss of heat through radiation is erroneous the assumption is false even on the scientist's own admission for as professor newcomb points out which is a popular astronomy uh, book pages 506 through 508 by losing heat a gaseous body contracts and the heat generated by the contraction exceeds that which is had to lose in order to produce the contraction paradox that a body gets hotter as the shrinking produced by its getting colder is greater led to a long dispute the surplus of heat it was argued was lost by radiation and to assume that the temperature is not lowered pari pasu with a decrease of volume under a constant pressure is to set a not the law of charles nebular theory windchill contraction develops heat it is true but contraction from cooling is incapable of developing the whole amount of heat at any time existing in the mass or even or of maintaining a body at a constant temperature professor windchill tried to reconcile the paradox of seeming one in fact as homer lanes proved 
by suggesting something besides heat. May it not be, he asked, simply a repulsion among the molecules, which varies according to some law of the distance. But even this was found irreconcilable, and unless this something besides heat is ticketed, causeless heat, the breath of fire, the all creative force plus absolute intelligence, which physical science is not likely to accept. However, it may be the reading of the stanza shows it, notwithstanding its archaic phraseology, to be more scientific than ever, even modern science. So in step 11, this is where the expanding and contraction of the web happens, which is indicative of the atoms being brought to life through this electrifying principle or pulsatory movement. This also points out that the ancients knew about the creation of the universe, also man and worlds. They knew what scientists still struggle to prove in this physical world, and they knew that there is internal and external heat in every atom. As above, so below, so within, so without. Here again is that principle of correspondence. They said the breath of the father spirit and the breath of the heat of the mother matter. This is just indicating again that they knew that heat was coming from outside the atom and inside the atom. Now 12 says the Sabat Havat sends Fohat to harden the atoms. Each of these is a part of the web universe reflecting the self-existent Lord primeval light like a mirror each becomes in turn a world. So the secret doctrine says Fohat hardens the atom. By infusing energy into them, he scatters the atoms or primordial matter. He scatters himself while scattering matter into atoms. It is through Fohat that the idea of the universal minds are impressed upon matter. Some faint idea of the nature of Fohat may be gathered from appellation. Cosmic electricity sometimes applies to it. But to be commonly known properly of electricity must in this case be added others, including intelligence. It is of the interest to note that modern science has to come to the conclusion that all cerebrations and brain activity are attended by electrical phenomenons. So this is just saying that the savab hot again is the eternal and the uncreated self-existent substance that creates all. It sends the fohat or the electrifying principle present in all atoms to harden the atoms. Now, when they say to harden the atoms, the fohat is the connecting agent between spirit and matter. So to harden the atoms, it to me means to manifest in the physical realm, to make hard or to make solid matter. Sabat Havat and fohat are both a part of the universe or web. When it says reflecting the self-existent Lord, it is referring to the logos or the primeval light. Remember, that light is the physical manifestation of love or logos. That is what this is referring to. All manifested matter is a reflection of God energy because it exists in every atom in our body. No, we cannot see it, but it is there. It is the electrifying principle that brings us into being. Every living thing or manifested being is vibrating because of this electrifying principle. And motion is in everything in this material world. In order for us to function properly, we have to become more electric because electricity must be added in order for the brain to function properly. The bodies to function properly, which we talked about when we talked about astral projection, right? How do we add electricity? We take in sunlight. You eat the foods that are made up of sunlight, which are fruits and vegetables, and you gain more knowledge because intelligence is also an electrifying principle as well. Now, be before we end this episode, I want to provide us a better understanding of the difference between these stanzas. So let me break down how Logos is manifested based on my understanding. Now, the first Logos is unmanifested, and it is the first stage of reawakening from this rest period, or what we call Praleia. The precosmic ideation radiates from the absolute darkness, but when this happens, there is no action in these primordial waters of chaos yet. It is just the divine idea being sent out. And the second logos is the bridge between the unmanifested and the manifested logi. It is often referred to as the semi-manifested logos. And there are three logi, the unmanifested father or ray of light or idea, the semi-manifested mother or waters of chaos, and the universe, which is the third logos. Helena often only talks about the unmanifested and manifested logos. So when the second 
logos emanates it is the father mother okay so this is spirit matter but the third is the virgin mother which is chaos or primeval deep so the third logos is the manifested logos so this is all happening in this stanza three where we're starting this reawakening process okay and by the end of stanza three we're starting to see this manifestation actually emerge next week when we talk about stanza four we're going to talk about this third logos which is basically the manifested universe okay so i hope this helps to bring some clarity next week we will start stanza four which again is where the universe starts to manifest so i love y'all deep and i will see y'all next week uh the resources are the same as of last week the secret doctrine by helena blavatsky the osafi wiki and the secret book of dyson